evening, everybody. Tonight, we're going to be studying the parable of the weeds and the grain, as you can see on the board there. Or if you want to call it the wheat and the tares, either one is fine with me. Either way, we're going to be in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 24 through 30, if you want to go ahead and open up to that. It's actually kind of a parable and an explanation in one. This is one of two parables that Jesus has in this section, where not only does he give the parable, but he also explains the interpretation of the parable. He doesn't do that a whole lot, especially in this chapter. As we'll see here in just a second, this is a chapter that is chock full of parables. There's all sorts of things that he's talking about here. But rarely does he then, at least in recorded scripture, does he then go in and say, this is the explanation of it. And he does it twice in this parable, once with the parable of the sower that we discussed several weeks ago. The second time is with this one, with the parable of the wheat and the tares. And so there's going to be kind of a two-parter to this. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. And then we're going to look, I think, around verse 36 and go down uh, through the end of the chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, down to verse 43 after that. That's the explanation part of it. The big difference here is, is that in the first parable, the parable of the sower, Jesus gives the explanation, the, the interpretation of his own accord. And this time, the disciples actually come to him in private and say, explain to us what that parable is all about. The parable is, is said very publicly, but it's explained very privately, which I think is kind of an interesting note on this. Um, but as you can tell, we're in the middle of this, this parable section. I appreciate those of you who have been with us every night of this, of this quarter and even every night of last quarter. Um, this quarantine and this, this Bible study that's in an online format is not ideal, but I appreciate your interest. I, I appreciate your attendance, virtual attendance every single night. Uh, we haven't really dipped in attendance the entire time that we've been doing these. And so I appreciate your interest and your participation your compliments, your comments that you've made uh, when I've gotten a chance to be with all of you. And so I appreciate all of that. Uh, parables are an interesting study. And as we've mentioned several times throughout this quarter, parables are just fascinating. They're meant to convey a spiritual truth um, through kind of not an entertaining way, but through kind of a detached perspective. That's the strength of parables Jesus goes into detail in Matthew chapter 13, as we saw several weeks ago, about why parables are so effective. But in the middle of this, I think right in between the parable and the explanation, Jesus says once again, or it's recorded once again, that Jesus did not go to them in parables. If you were to look at the amount of time that Jesus spends in, quote, storytelling, um, or telling in parables throughout the Gospels, they make up a sizable chunk of his overall conversations. I mean, it's something around the neighborhood of 20 to 30 percent of his conversations he has with other people is parable based. So he really relies heavily on stories. And that's why I think uh, this chapter, I, I'm sorry, that's why I think this quarter is so important. Because when we understand these parables, not only do we understand these deep spiritual truths, but we also got kind of an insight into Jesus's mindset and his approach to teaching in general. So that's been the reason why I wanted to spend this quarter studying it. I appreciate those of you who have been with us. Hopefully you've gotten that out as well. I want to begin as we start every class with, I want to ask the question, what is this parable really about? And every time when we have an in-person class, when we study these types of things, I always want to get the audience's opinion about it first because parables are so commonly talked about that everyone has an opinion about them beforehand. And the parable of the wheat and the tares is no different. People, when they talk about the wheat and tares, they have a whole bunch of different ideas about what he's talking about. Some people would say, well, this story is all about judgment. It's all about God's judgment that he's going to have at the end of time. Some people will take kind of a deviation off of that, and they'll say this parable is all about God's judgment during the um, during the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and that this has not an eschatology-type feel, an end times type feel, but more of an immediate fulfillment I think that misses the point. So if that's been your interpretation of it to this point, I would encourage you to reconsider what he's actually addressing here. And I think people that take it in that type of metaphor kind of lose the impact. Some people go the opposite direction. They'll say it, you know, it talks about God's judgment, but what it really discusses is the idea of God's patience. And I think that's involved in that too. You know, when we when we read passages like 2 Peter chapter 3 that say the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Uh, but it's long-suffering, hoping that all should come to repentance. I think you kind of see that here. Now, Calvinists have a field day with this parable because they'll say, well, there's no real reason for God to be patient because the tear isn't all of a sudden going to become a wheat. And so if God is, you know, if God is sitting there waiting for that, then it, it's just not going to happen. I think, I think that is taking this analogy that's in this parable, I think that's taking that a little too far. Uh, but nevertheless, I think God's patience is still in view here, that he's hoping that all should come to repentance. So I think this parable illustrates that very well. Some people will say it's talking about the local church, that it's our responsibility within the local church to do those types of, you know, individual type disciplines that God is going to do at the end of time. Maybe that's our responsibility. Other people say this is all about persecution. The tares are sucking up the nutrients 
of the of the wheat and so it's about persecution it's about trying to coexist with people that are not spiritually minded i think almost all of those types of things can be in view here and so I want to ask you before we even begin, what's this parable about? Even if you don't want to put it in the comments, which I understand that that hardly anybody is actually doing that. Some people are texting me, but I want you to think about what this parable is about in your or to yourself before we go into it. As we're always going to do as well, I always want to look at the context. And this parable has a lot of context that we've talked about before. We talked about the parable of the sower, Matthew chapter 13, uh, the first 23 verses. We discussed that, I think maybe week one, two or three, something along those lines. So the context is very similar. This is the in the middle of what is a long, kind of drawn out stretch about kingdom parables, uh, most of which are plant based. Most of them are about seeds, about planting, about leaven. Um, even the treasure in the field has to do with a field that someone goes and buys. All of those are are given that way because the people that he's talking to. That's something that's very relatable to them. Whenever you're teaching a parable, whenever you're telling a story, you want to find something that people can relate to. And so you see that with these parables. But all of these parables, to a certain extent, describe the nature of the kingdom. Whether you're talking about evangelism in the first 23 verses, whether you're talking about the growth of it, you're talking about the value of it, whether you're talking about you know, the, the potentiality of it, about how the gospel can blow up into something big, if you're talking about the parable of the mustard seed, all of those things come into view here. But... But the parable of the the wheat, the parable of the wheats and the tares fits right in between that, or right in the middle of that, because it kind of it doesn't cast a shadow over the idea of the kingdom parables, but it talks about the reality of the situation, the idea that when you're sitting in a church building, surrounded by 100, 150 other people, other Christians, people who purport to you know worship God and serve God and honor God, there are going to be tares within that. Now, I want to make something very plain. When when we talk about this parable in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is very explicit that the tares and the wheat, the field, represents the world. Some people, especially reformers, Augustine was big on this, the idea, I like to say that the, the idea here is, is that the, the field is the church. And even though the field can include the church, obviously the church is in the world, he's also talking, I think, about the world. Uh, the gospel is supposed to be spread over the entire world. And there are going to be people who claim to follow God from all different walks of life who are not really following God, but look like they do. I'll give you an example. You hear a lot of people say sometimes, you know, I know they're going to heaven because they're just such a good person. Well, that person can look on the surface very similar to what a Christian looks like. They do very similar good works. They may help out the poor. They may, you know, be very humble, not arrogant, that type of stuff. Maybe keep themselves free from vices. But without that devotion towards God, they're not a wheat. They're not, you know, the, they're not a Christian. There's a, there's a marked difference between the two. So keep that in mind as we're going through this, that when he says that the field is the world, he means the world. He doesn't just mean the church. I think that's sometimes kind of a misunderstanding that we have when we talk about this parable. But nevertheless, when you look at this parable of the sower, it, 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 or I'm sorry, the parable of the wheat and tares, it comes right off the, parable, the heels of the parable of the sower. And the parable of the wheat and tares, if you look at it as a two-parter with the parable of the sower, you can kind of see the same, obviously in in many, many more verses, the same type of idea that he gets to with the parable of the wedding feast. If you remember, the parable of the wedding feast is, is all about how he sends out invitations to everybody and the people make all sorts of excuses about why they don't want to show up, they don't want to come. Well, then he goes out and he invites people from the highways and the byways. So they come into his feast. But then he goes into the feast, and this is the second part of that parable. He goes into the feast, and he notices that there's somebody that is there, and they're not dressed in the right attire. And so he throws them out into the into the outer darkness, and weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's kind of the same thing that you look at with these two parables. The parable of the sower, they cast the seed wide. There are some people that reject it, some people that accept it. And then the second part of that, when you look at the parable of the wheat and tares, is you have a kingdom that has both wheat and tares inside of it. There's somebody who is sitting in there, if you think about the parable of the wedding feast, there's somebody who's sitting in there who doesn't have the right clothes on, cast out into outer darkness, cast out into the area where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so these parables kind of operate sequentially like that. The parable of the wheat and tares forms a very nice part two to the story of the, the parable of the sower. So think about these parables kind of together here. As you can see down in verse 51, jump down to the end of this chapter, Matthew chapter 13, verse 51. After all of these things that Jesus says, all of these parables about the mustard seed, the leaven, the treasure in the field, the dragnet, in verse 51, 
he kind of has what some people would put as the last parable within the section. Whether or not you view it as a parable is up to you. But in verse 51 and 52, he says, Have you understood all of these things? They said to him, Yes. So Jesus uses the parables, parable method, so that these people can understand what he's talking to them about. And then he addresses them at the end by saying, Do you understand what this what I'm saying? I want to make sure of that. They say to him, Yes. The application then falls in verse 52 where he says, Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Some people make the application there. He's talking about new and old testaments. I think he's just talking about using the right things at the right time. All of these parables that you find in Matthew chapter 13 address different ideas about the kingdom. And so our job, according to what Paul says to Timothy as a, as a righteous steward, our job is to discern you know, when the right time is to use these parables. This parable applies to this situation. This parable applies to this situation. All of these parables address different concepts. And our job is to take these different concepts and to use them at the appropriate time. I think that's what he means when he says all this in verses 51 through 52. Now, let's jump right into this parable in Matthew chapter 13, because I think there's a lot in this section that I want to get into, we only spent, you know, 12 or 13 minutes inside of the context. It's a lot less than we normally do. And that's because this parable of the wheat and the tares has a lot to it. And there's a lot of thought questions. There's a lot of things that are worth meditating on. And that's what I really wanted to spend our time on tonight. Matthew chapter 13, starting verse 20, 24. It goes down through verse 30. It's very short. It's very punchy. It's very to the point. But it's, once again, very similar to what he has been talking about up until this point in verse 23. So, once again, view this parable as kind of a two-parter. Verse 24, Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. I want to stop right there. He sows good seed. He doesn't sow tares. That's not his intent. So anyone who says to them, God is just out to hurt me. God's gospel is not beneficial. It's just is, is pain. It's punishment. That's not his intent. The intent and the gospel is good. What people do with it is sometimes bad, but the gospel is good. I want to make that point very plain. Verse 25, while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to him, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you were gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to gather together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. I want to put something forth to you before we go any further. When you look at verses 24 through 30, he is not addressing the idea of AD 70. He's not addressing the end of the Roman Empire. He is describing the judgment day. And that will come crystal clear in a few minutes when we get into the explanation. But he talks about the period of the harvest. He talks about the period when all the sheaves are going to be gathered. They're going to be separated. That imagery is all throughout the book of Matthew. You see that in the great throne scene in Matthew chapter 25, when all of humanity is dropped in front of him and he separates the good from the bad, the faithful to the unfaithful. There's a whole lot of imagery that's here in this passage. So I want to get that out here very quickly. But notice also that the good seed is sown intentionally. So is the bad seed. People sometimes think that, that you know, doc, false doctrine just kind of comes about naturally, that, you know, it just kind of comes about accidentally. It comes about a lot of times because of an agenda. And sometimes that agenda can seem innocent. After all, a lot of false doctrine, at least that I'm aware of, that I know about, comes about because people say, well, this can't be true because I feel in my heart this way. Or this can't be true because, because if that's true, then that means this person that I love is not saved. And so we, we tend to adapt doctrine to situations. And when we do that, we create false doctrine, sometimes out of nice motivations. I don't know whatever, honest, honest certainly isn't the right word. Good, honest isn't, good isn't the right word. But we sometimes create it out of non-malicious type of intents. But nevertheless, false, false doctrine comes about intentionally. Very rarely does somebody just accidentally slip into false doctrine. It usually comes about because of some type of aim or some type of goal that they're pursuing. So keep that in mind as you go through this. Good seed is sowed intentionally. Bad seed is sown intentionally. 
And that's something that they understand. When you look in verse 27, they say, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? So there's no other explanation for why the tares are alongside the wheat with the exception of the fact that somebody has come in and done that. And that's why he says in verse 28, an enemy has done this. Now, the response from the slaves is very honest. Do you want us then to go and gather them up? And the master says in verse 29, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. The master's plan here in this passage is that if is that we're going to let both of them grow at the same time. We're going to let them grow simultaneously. Because if you go out there and start uprooting the wheat and start yanking out the wheat, I'm sorry, start yanking out the tares, then you're going to, by necessity, hurt the wheat with them. That's the core principle of this idea. You know, sometimes people have this idea that that they think God should just punish the evil right now. And there's there's actually two sides of this, because when you look, for instance, at some of the Psalms, David argues that the, the wicked are just, you know, living in prosperity and, and wicked are just living in luxury. And he wonders why God's judgment hasn't come upon them yet. The other side of the equation, you have Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah. When God says, I'm going to annihilate Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham asks the exact same question that is asked in this passage from the master. If you do that, Abraham says, you're going to hurt the righteous alongside the wicked. So you, you can't sweep away the righteous when you sweep away the wicked. There's going to be that collateral damage. Now, what God points out to him in that passage is there's not really any righteous there. That's not really going to happen. Even when you move into Ezekiel, for instance, when it talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, 596, 606, he even makes the argument that if Noah and Daniel, and I, I can't remember who else, David maybe was there, Job I think maybe is the third person, even if those three people are there, they could only save their own souls. So in that destruction, even though everybody was annihilated, there was still a spiritual salvation that took place for those who were faithful to God. And there were people that were faithful to God in those days. There has to be, at least in that point. But nevertheless, this question, this parable answers the question, why doesn't God just annihilate the evil within seconds? And certainly all of us have felt like that way at a certain point. You know, if God was truly righteous, if God was truly holy, then he would look down on this earth and he would smite people. Like he did with Ananias and Sapphira, for instance. God would look down and he would just zap them dead in that moment. And that sounds, appealing isn't the right word, but that sounds tempting sometimes in our life to view God's judgment that way. But think about this. Think about if God had applied that same principle to you. All of us, according to Romans chapter 3, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And how just do you think it would be, or how much would you appreciate it, if God decided to zap you dead that moment that you committed your sin? Not only would it be cruel, but it would be kind of unjust. Because hopefully now you're living your life close to God. But I guarantee you, like myself, like everybody else, there were moments in your life where you were not the Christian that you should have been. There were times in my life that I am so glad God didn't come back in that moment. There are times in my life that I'm so glad that nothing happened to me because I knew at that time I was living my life apart from God. And so even though we may be very tempting to say, why doesn't just God sweep away the evil? We forget about the fact that at some points in our life, that would have included us. And thanks be to God that he did not strike us down in those moments whenever we committed those sins. And I think some of that is in view here. When he says, if I do that, in verse 29, if I do that, you're going to uproot the wheat with them. God knows humans. He knows us. And he knows that if he smites us dead in that moment, that there are going to be, there's going to be collateral damage. People that may have eventually come to God that never had the opportunity to because they were collected. It's, at the very least, it's not wise. And the master understands that. The tares aren't necessarily you know, destroying the wheat. It's not as if they're kind of coming in and tearing down the wheat. Allow them both to grow together. And in the harvest, when, all, when everything's said and done, when the time is right, then we will separate the two from each other. So that's the wisdom that the master shows at this point. But I want you to notice that the, the evidence of which one is wheat and which one is tares doesn't show up until they're full grown. That's a very important principle to keep in mind. Most commentators think that the type of tear that he's addressing here is a specific type of tear called Darnell, 
um, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but it looks very, very, very similar to wheat, as you can see there in the picture. The, one of those is wheat, one of those is a tear. They look very, very similar. And so what's going to happen if somebody tries to separate them as he's threshing, as he's harvesting, um, then they're going to inevitably make some mistakes. Now, God does not make mistakes. What he's showing here is, is that he's going to wait for the right time. That's what Jesus is really addressing here. But it's not until after those are fully grown that the problem is evident. And I think you can see that within the church as well. You know, when you look, for instance, at the parable of the sower that we, you know, we didn't cover last week, but is right before this, Matthew 13, 1 through 23, this, the seed is sown. And some of it is accepted, some of it is rejected, but not all of it is rejected immediately. Some of it springs forth and the persecutions of the world kind of tear it back down. Some of it springs forth and the cares of this world choke it down. Some of it springs forth because there's no foundation, it withers away. So it's not always evident at the beginning stages which one is wheat and which one is tares. And that's the same principle that Jesus is grappling towards with this idea. When you, when we convert somebody, when we spread the gospel far and wide, the natural response almost immediately is joy. I have never in my life baptized somebody who didn't immediately come up out of that water and was 10 times more joyful than they were when they went in. So only throughout time, but only throughout time, can you see really whether or not that seed has taken root. You can only see what that person you know, whether that person, where he goes and whether or not he remains a Christian over time. I think that's the same thing that you're seeing here as well. All of us know people that sit next to us and, and all of us have sat next to people for years that, you know, sang the same songs that we did. People that amen the same sermons, amen the same prayers, that maybe taught Bible classes. And after knowing them for 30, 20, 30 years, only then, maybe in a time of persecution, does their, does their real beliefs kind of come out and it's disheartening to see and i think you can see that very very well in today's world with covid you know covid has a way the last four months of revealing where people are really at in their approach towards god and there are some people making huge issues out of basic safety precautions because they feel like their american civil liberties are being squashed there are some people who will refuse to do things to help their fellow christian simply because of a personal stance on it. There are some people who are refusing to come back to services because they've convinced themselves that the digital services are just as good. Never mind the fact that they don't get to see people in real life and worship together as as you know the opportunity presents itself. So COVID has a way of revealing persecution at large has a way of revealing what's truly in your heart about your relationship to God. Keep in mind that the early church grew pretty steadily through the first three centuries. But in those times of severe persecution, the people that turned on each other, or the, the people that persecuted Christians the most was not necessarily the Romans, but it was other Christians that were turning their fellow Christians in. People that were playing the harlot with Rome and, and they were turning their fellow Christians in. Persecution has a way of revealing what's truly in your heart and where your position and your stance towards God really is. So, I think that's a good lesson that we can take out of that. Not until these wheat and tares are fully grown can you really identify which one is which. Now, I want to look down at verse 36. Jump over verses 31 through 35. That's the inter intermediary section, more parables. Verses 34 and 35 is what we addressed at the beginning. Jesus never spoke to them without a parable. Verse 36, the scenery changes. No longer is Jesus addressing the crowds. As a matter of fact, in verse 36, it says he leaves the crowds, goes into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. They want to know what Jesus was getting at. In verse 36 or verse 37, Jesus doesn't hold anything back. He doesn't say, I can't believe you didn't understand what I was talking about. I can't believe that you're so dense. Verse 36, he says, then he left, I'm sorry, verse 37, says the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. It's, it's point blank. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. All of us as, as disciples are, are spreading that good seed. Verse 38, the field is the world. As for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the evil one. The field is the world. That's our landscape. That's our harvest. That's our reaping area. The entire world, not just the church. 
the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, tares are the sons of the evil one. I want to make a quick point about verse 38. Notice how he says these are the sons of the kingdom. That's a that's a real sticking point with Matthew within this gospel, the idea of the kingdom being spiritual, but also specifically in Matthew 13. All of these parables are kingdom parables. So he's keeping that theme going. Verse 39, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. The harvest is the end of the age, not the end of, you know, the the apostolic age, AD 70, AD 90, not the end of the Roman age, the end of the age, the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. This mirrors very well with what Paul would talk about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he says that he is going to He's going to, the dead in Christ shall arise. We'll meet them in the air. It's very similar to that idea. Some people look at verse 39 and they say the reapers being angels, you know, that means that when we die, that angels will carry us, you know, to judgment. And there are some people that look at that in the same vein that they look at, you know, the parable of the rich man of Lazarus. When Lazarus died, angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. I don't know if that's really taking it too far or not. I think you could probably deduce there's something like that. But regardless, in verse 39, the angels are being used as a reaping tool, an instrument for reaping. Verse 40, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear." there's any debate about the end of the age not being AD 70, you can see, number one, the fact that they're going to be thrown in the furnace of fire in verse 42, but the the reason that they're going to be thrown in the furnace of fire is in verse 41. They're stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. That has no connotation to AD 70. It has everything to do with the end of time, with Judgment Day, that type of stuff. So some of these people, though, I think when you look at this parable, and remember, we asked the question at the beginning, what is Jesus addressing? Some people look at this parable as a license to not exercise church discipline at, on a local level. Some people say, well, we can't exercise church discipline because God is going to do that at the end of time. And if God is going to do that at the end at the end of time, then I don't need to do that right now. You certainly see that in the world around us. You know, people say judging isn't my job. I'm not God. Yeah, I'll leave that up to God. I'm, I'm not here to judge. I came here to spread love, that type of stuff. That misses the point entirely because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is explicit that we need to cut out the the leaven, the little leaven leavens the whole lump. You need to remove that person from you. Matter of fact, the argument that they were making when they were glorying in it was the idea that they could, you know, they were so tolerant that they could just accept everybody into the kingdom. That's the thing that Paul is saying you should not be glorying in at all whatsoever. There needs to be some kind of discipline. John addresses that in all three of his epistles, that you need to be mindful of those who claim, as he says in 1 John chapter 4, those who claim they're Christians and are not. Test the spirits. Diotrephes in 3 John, the, the Antichrist in 2 John. There are so many times where the apostles say church discipline on a local level needs to be enforced. And yet there are some people who will use this as an argument for non-church discipline. That's not the point. God is going to exercise final judgment, but we also need to, if for no other reason, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we also need to exercise local discipline so that that person can be saved in the day of judgment. Discipline was never just an I hate you type of thing. It was always geared towards bringing that person back towards God. When you look at, when you look at this explanation, verses 36 through 43, it's so simple that the tares are going to be there, the wheat's going to be there, but both of them are going to be allowed to grow together until the harvest time, and that's when they're going to be separated. It speaks to the patience of God. It speaks to his long suffering that he allows us to grow together, and he allows people of the world time to repent, to come back to God. But it also is a sign of compassion on those of us who are loyal towards God that we don't have unnecessary collateral damage from the judgment that's inflicted on other people. I want to point out verse 43, because verse 43 probably gives us an occasion to pause. Verse 43 is, is interesting. Verse 43 says very simply, The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. If your translation is anything like mine, you probably have some kind of indication that 
that phrase, the righteous will shine forth as the sun, is taken from somewhere else. Now, it's not word for word lifted. There are a couple different you know, cross-references to it. For instance, Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 18 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. So what he kind of is hinting at is that the, the word of the Lord is bright. Those who are Christians grow brighter and brighter over time. It's so evident as you progress as a Christian that your faith is directed towards God. It grows brighter and brighter like the sun. But I think probably a more closer analysis is in Daniel, the 12th chapter. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. This is not the only time that this phrase or this type of phrase is used in the Old Testament. But to me, it's certainly the most explicit. And I think it has a pretty good crossover with what he's addressing here in Matthew, the 13th chapter. Daniel chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And the worst thing you can do with this chapter is just lift it out of context. But that's what we're going to do right now. Daniel chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will rise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found in the written, of the, written in the book will be rescued. There are some people who argue this is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Other people who argue that it's talking about the end of the age. I think you can be talking about both of them, honestly. I don't think it's necessarily exclusive to one or the other. I know there are lots of people that will disagree with me about that, but I think it can apply probably to both of them. Now, specifically, probably one or the other, but I think at large, the principle applies to both. Verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will wake these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, verse 4, Daniel, conceal these words, seal the book until the end time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. In verse 3, it's an interesting kind of idea that those who have insight, those who have understanding, will shine brightly like the expanse of the kingdom of heaven, and will those who lead the many to righteous like the stars forever and ever. It, like Proverbs chapter 4, it has the idea that a righteous person will become brighter and brighter throughout time. And I think going back to the idea of Matthew chapter 13 with the wheat and the tares, it's not until they're full grown that you can really tell which one is which. But in a lot of ways, when they're in the field, their good qualities are kind of muted. You know, if you look around us, if you look at the world, if you look at the local church, if you look at your friends, if you look at your family members, everyone who claims to be Christians, there are a lot of people who claim to be Christians that are not. And it's hard to tell sometimes who's faithful and who's not. After all, the most visible things are people that show up to church building, people that show up or people that, you know, may may baptize somebody else. Those things are very, very visible. But it's not always ironclad. And I think whenever you see people on Judgment Day, whenever we stand in that great gulf of humanity, we look across and we see everybody that is standing there throughout time, those who are faithful to God will be very evident. They'll be on one side. Those who are not faithful will be on the other side. Those qualities, good and bad, will be extremely visible. And as a side point, I think one of the best things about being in heaven is realizing that you're, you're there with the people, the best people that have existed throughout humanity, the people that were closest to God, the people who really honestly, down to their core, loved God and served him with every single thing that they had. You're in the best possible company. On earth, it's hard to discern that. It's hard to see in this world who's truly faithful and who's not truly faithful, even though we see who's there on Sunday and who's not there on Sunday. Even though we see people who do public service, we see those types of people, it's hard to know whether or not they're really truly faithful. And that's not a condemnation. It's just a reality of the situation. In ju on Judgment Day, it will become evident. It will become very clear who's faithful to God and who will not be faithful to God. And that's why when he says here at the beginning of all this, in Matthew chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like this field. There's so many applications about that, about how these things can grow up together and then about how they are not truly discernible until the end of time. It's because of that, that revealing at the end of time that the rest of these parables here in Matthew the 13th chapter are mentioned. For instance, if you look at verse 44, right after he says, the righteous will shine forth as the son of the kingdom of father. He was ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he says in verse 43, he was ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, open up your eyes, open up your ears to what I'm telling you. He then says in verse 44, 
The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. From joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The kingdom of heaven, verse 45, is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and saw all that he had, and he bought that pearl. When you realize what the importance of the kingdom is, and the fact that being in the kingdom is the most important citizenship that we can have as human beings we realize also simultaneously the value in it. It's very clear in the end of time who's in the kingdom and who's not. And it'll be also be clear to us as humans the value of being in that kingdom on that last day. So the parable of the wheat and tares, very fascinating parable, very interesting parable. I think it's good to reflect on. It's a much more personal parable than I think sometimes we care to admit. It's not just describing the state of the world. It's not just describing you know this and that. It's describing me and whether or not I'm a wheat and whether or not I'm a tear. I may fool myself and think, oh, I'm because of this, I'm a wheat. When in reality, I'm more of a tear. But God knows. And in the final judgment, it will become very clear to us. It will become clear to everybody. It will become clear to God. Next week, what we're going to discuss is another farming-related parable, the parable of the wicked uh, tenants in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. We'll focus on next week the fact that this is probably – the worst parable that Jesus could have spoken at that moment in time if he was hoping to make it out of Jerusalem alive. We'll discuss the fact that because of the things he said, because of the things he did, there's a reason he was crucified inside of a week. That's And this parable, the parable of the wicked tenants, plays really heavily into that idea. So once again, I appreciate your interest. I appreciate your your attendance, your your desire to learn more about God. And I hope that as we go throughout this week, and as we go through our lives, we'll be closer to being wheat than we are being tares. Thank you, everybody.